Hi class, uh, we're going to talk about row and column space. Uh, this video is going to be pretty short, um, even compared to the last video. Um, a lot of things that we covered in the last video are repeated here. So there's really just an example or two to go over. Um, it's really just an extension of 4.2. Really the meat and bones of 4.3 was covered in the 4.2 video. So if you haven't watched that or you don't remember what was talked about in that, I suggest you make sure you're really solid on the previous video um, before you jump into this one. So we're really just extending the ideas of 4.2 in this section, right? So let's say we have a matrix A that is N by M, right? So N rows, M columns. The row space of this matrix, okay, which we denote by row of A, we actually talked about that in the last video quite a bit. Um, this is a subspace of R sub M, okay, spanned by the rows of A. So similarly, the column space of A, which we call column of A, is the subspace of Rn that's spanned by the columns of A. So remember, row of A is a space, column of A is a space, and the null of A is also a space, right? It is a, it, it's what's generated by a set of vectors, okay? So consider this uh, matrix. So again, we use this matrix all over the place in the last video, right? So we actually used only this matrix in the last video, and we really just talked about this single matrix a lot. So we're really just doing the same idea. We're, we're going to say use the same matrix that we're already familiar with from the last time. And we're just going to talk about um, it in terms of rows and column space, right? So if you remember the reduced row echelon form looked like this. And if you don't remember, then that's fine. Uh, what we had said was that the pivot positions here, okay, told me which vectors from the column space form the basis for the space generated by all of the columns. And then where the free variables were, it told me what um, the null space of A was, right? And it also told me the dimension of the null space of A. So for right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab the position, right? Where these columns are located, okay? The pivot positions will tell me the row space of A. So since these two have pivots, okay, then these rows, the first row and the second row, generate the row space of A. Okay, so what we we're doing before was we took the transpose of this and we we're writing things as uh, row vectors and we kind of did the same thing to do a reduced row echelon form and where the pivot positions were that's how we figured out how to find a secondary basis for these column vectors okay so we're really doing the same sort of thing here we are not taking the transpose we're taking these vectors and we're keeping them as columns okay and so what we're doing is we're taking it to reduced row echelon form and the rows that have the pivots is the rows that form the basis for the row space of a Okay. Similarly, the places where the pivots are in columns tell me what column vectors of A create the column space of A. Okay. So we're using this column space of A to create our basis out of the original basis vectors that we had when in our last video. Okay. So row space and column space can both be found by just taking your matrix A and reducing it to row echelon form, okay, or reduced row echelon form. So the rows that have a pivot position coincide with the original rows of A that form a basis for the row space. The columns that have the pivot positions coincide with the original column vectors of A that form a basis for the column space of A. So here's the theorem. The dimension of the column space, which is in this case is two, is always going to be equal to the dimension of the row space of A, which is also two, which makes sense because there's only two pivots here, right? The pivots in the columns will be the same as the pivots in the rows. Pivots in the columns as the pivots in the rows, okay? 
So we call this the rank of A. So the rank of A is a value, okay? The rank is the dimension of the row space or the dimension of the column space. And we denote this as rank of A, okay? So for our previous example, the rank of A was two because both the column space has two and the row space also has a dimension of two. So for our next theorem, let A be an N by M matrix then the rank of A is equal to the nullity of A, which equals M. So this is, again, a repeat of a theorem that we had in 4.2. However, now we have notations to go with this, okay? So the rank is the dimension of the row or column space. The nullity is the dimension of the null space. M is the number of columns that I have, okay? So the number of basis vectors for my row or column space plus the number of basis vectors for the null space is equal to the total number of columns that I have, period. Okay. So again, we had an example of this in the last section, which I repeated here, right? So A has two free variables. When I put it into reduced row echelon form, when I set it equal to zero, so the null space has a dimension of two. Okay. Uh, we could have also just noticed that the rank of A was two, and since I have four column vectors, okay, one, two, three, four, and my column space is, my rank is two, four minus two will give me the dimension of the null space, which is again, the number of free variables that I'm gonna have, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> let's have another theorem. Let A be uh, N by M, let B be in R, this should be in R N. Okay, so apologies here. This should be this is a vector, um, so there should be a, a subscript. I'm sorry, a superscript here. Apologies for that. So A X equals B is consistent if and only if B is in the column space of A, meaning that my basis vectors can create B by a linear combination, right? So if I'm basically saying that B has to be in the span of the basis vectors for the column space of A, okay? If that's true, then I have a consistent system, right? Expanding on that is that AX equals B has a unique solution, consistent, right? If and only if B is in the column space of A, okay? And the columns of A are linearly independent or i.e. that the rank of A is equal to the number of vectors I have, okay? So again, this would be saying um, I have a three by three matrix and all of those column vectors in my matrix are linearly independent, right? So then my column space in that case would be three, my row space would be three. Um, so my rank is equal to M, my null space is zero, okay? So here is the unifying theorem. So again, I said I go over this every so often. So we have a few things to add to this from what we had before. I think before we had up to H. So we have quite a few more things to add. So before I was calling these A's, I don't know why I call it S right now, but that's fine. So let S be a set of vectors, A1 through AN. I think previously I called it a fancy curse of A. It doesn't really matter what I call it. In this case, we can let S be a subspace, right? It's a set of vectors. A is the matrix created by that set of vectors. T is a linear transformation given by um, this matrix A times any vector X in the domain. Then if one of the following are true, all of them are true. Same thing if one of them is false, then all of them are false, right? So S spans Rn, okay? If that's true, then S is also linearly independent, okay? The matrix equation AX equals B has a unique solution for every B in Rn. So again, that's very similar to this theorem right here. Um, in AX equal B having a unique solution if B is in the column space, right? Of course, this would be true because my column space is the entire set, right? Which we'll see also, okay? My linear transformation is onto, 
Okay, and that comes with as being a spanning set of Rn, my uh, my range. T is one to one. That should be true because the vectors are linearly independent in that matrix transform that we have. A is invertible. Okay, the kernel of T is the zero vector. So the only thing that gets sent to the zero vector here is the zero vector itself. And that comes from it being linearly independent. S is a basis for Rn. And that should make sense as well because S is a spanning set and it is linearly independent. That means it is a basis for the space that I'm in. Okay. The kernel, the column space of A is all of Rn. Okay. And that makes sense because Ax equals B has a unique solution for every B in Rn. Remember that now falls out from here, right? My column vectors are all um, form a basis, basically, okay? The row space of A is also Rn, and that should make sense, uh, make sense because the column space of A and the row space of A have the same dimension, and if their dimension is N, because they generate Rn, then they generate the same space. They generate all of Rn. The rank of A is N because the dimension of the column space of A is the dimension of Rn, which is N. Okay. And the determinant of A is not equal to zero. Again, this is my favorite one because if this is true, I can say all of these things are true. All right. So <clears throat> very short video. Okay. Hopefully this helps things out a little bit. Hopefully it clears some things up. Hopefully it does not confuse you more. Okay. Uh, see you guys on the next video. Thanks.